Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Grand Rounds. I am Regine Diacqua, Assistant Dean of Diversity, Culture, and Inclusion here at Mailman. I'd like to start us off with a land acknowledgement. We owe our existence and vitality to those before us who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted, and some have been brought against their will. We are gathered on the occupied and unceded land of the Lenape, Rockaway, and Canarsie peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape, Rockaway, and Canarsie communities, their elders, both past and present, their descendants, as well as future generations. We sit in spaces funded, governed by, and named for families who derived their wealth from the transatlantic slave trade and plantation slavery. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the enslaved African peoples, their elders, both past and present, as well as their descendants and their future generations. Columbia University acknowledges that it was founded upon the exclusion and erasure of many indigenous peoples, and that slavery has been intertwined with the life of the college and the university. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, violence, slavery, displacement, and migration through ongoing education and responsible representation. And now I'd like to turn the podium over to Dean Freed. Thank you, Dr. Diaqua. I should say Dean Diaqua. And good afternoon and welcome to the opening of this year's Grand Rounds on the Future of Public Health by Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. For those of, us, for those of you who haven't joined us before, this once a month event, which is school-wide and campus-wide, brings to our campus leaders in public health and related fields and gathers our community to interact, to learn from each other, and to use the conversations and learning that we accomplish here to really craft innovative and ever more effective scientific approaches and solutions to critical local, national, and global public health challenges. I'd like to offer a special welcome to our brand new students who are here today, as well as the rest of us who are ongoing students. As you all know, 2019 is the year that marks the 400th anniversary of the initiation of slavery in the United States, when 20 Africans were brought in bondage to Jamestown, Virginia. As a school, we have committed this academic year to recognizing the deep connections between that very grim anniversary and the consequences that rolled out over the sub subsequent 400 years of embedded inequality. As public health scientists and practitioners, we know, we know that inequity is at the root of so many of the challenges we face which is why this conversation today and over the course of the year together is critical for us to have. Though the events of this, through the events of this academic year, some of which we've listed here on the slide, we will explore what this inheritance means for us as individuals, for our school, for our country, and for the public's health. The goal is to initiate a process of inquiry together on how, based on the new understanding that we acquire, how we can better tackle and resolve this normative inequality and division and its deep effects on health, and to figure out the public health leadership and solutions that we can bring to bear to transform our way out of inequality. We're starting today 
with an inquiry on our home turf, which is science. How can science help us see more clearly the causes and solutions of inequalities? And conversely, when do we as scientists abandon science due to our own blind spots? Why do we sometimes not challenge the myths we hold with a search for evidence that would be needed to test them? I'd like to provide two examples um, which go to that last point. One comes from 1851, but unfortunately is still alive today and was provided by Dean Fulalove. Um, it should not surprise us, perhaps, if we tee into the myths of stereotypes, that in 1851, the New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journal carried a piece on the diseases and peculiarities of the Negro race, and I quote, this article in a respected medical journal claimed a number of myths as fact regarding intelligence and physiology. Um, claims that, to be honest, I really don't want to repeat because there's no factual basis for any of them. But perhaps it would surprise us if we look at the recent medical literature and sometimes even public health literature that in the modern era, many of these myths continue to persist or science continues to try and debunk them because they do persist. And this includes myths such as, the, um, as, as Bob has pointed out, that myths that blacks require stronger x-ray treatments than whites because skin is thicker. Myths that blacks are biologically suited to tolerate pain better than whites which all of these myths, which have no basis in scientific fact, untested result in medical treatment that differs by race. These issues are alive in our scientific literature and they're alive in our practice, rooted in those articles in 1851. But myths dominate science for other non-privileged groups non-privileged groups who do not fit into our image of the norm. For instance, why did it take science 22 years after the 1964 U.S. Surgeon General's report that said smoking was deleterious to health in men for the U.S. Surgeon General to announce 22 years later that it turned out it wasn't good for women either? How can we, as scientists, allow our, our biases and perceptions to occlude our knowledge of how to think about biologic plausibility? That failed in both of those instances. As I did my own summer reading this summer, uh, reading Howard Zinn's book on people's history of the United States, I was deeply struck in ways I had really never appreciated before. How, not just how inequality has been embedded th historically through intentional policies, but also how the most effective part of those policies has been to divide groups, making our differences more salient to us than our similarities, and breeding out sympathy for the experiences of others. The result, too effectively, is a difficulty and sometimes an inability to create common cause. In this year's journey, one challenge will be how to hear each other, how to empathize with others' experiences of inequalities, even though they may, may not be your own, and how to understand them as not denigrating one's own experiences, but rather a basis for mutual learning and more success in solutions. I do believe that all of us are in this to dismantle the bases for inequalities 
And we're in it to use our tools of how to acquire knowledge through science to get close to truth. And we need to learn better how to recognize stereotypes and untruths and how to develop the science that will debunk it. In this, we'll need to include also ways to recognize and build common cause in order to find and implement solutions that work and solutions that last. So today, I am really deeply honored to introduce the starter set of this journey with five of our very own faculty members who are each leaders in public health and could not be more perfect to launch us in this science-grounded conversation with our community, which is aptly titled, Framing Our Struggles for Justice. These faculty represent a number of different fields and disciplines within the large umbrella of public health. In the interests of time, I will only introduce, but not share their numerous accolades, because each of these individuals has many. I suspect that by the end of today's discussion, you'll understand why they were nominated by our planning group to participate in this event. I'll start, of course, with Robert Fullalove, our moderator for today's conversation. I'll mention each person and then invite you to come up and sit down. Um, of course, Dr. Fullalove is Associate Dean of Community and Minority Affairs here at the Mailman School and Professor of Sociomedical Sciences. Bob, welcome. Um, <laughs> Joining Dr. Fullalove is Dr. David Bell, Associate Professor of Population and Family Health and Medical Director of the Young Men's Clinic. David. I think I'm going in alphabetical order, not seed order, because next is uh, Professor Merlin Chaquanian, who is Assistant Professor of Sociomedical Sciences. Merlin. Dr. Jasmine McDonald, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology. And fourth, Professor Frederica Pereira, Professor of Environmental Health Sciences and former Director of the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health. begin, I would like to take a moment to thank some individuals and departments who have taken a real leadership role in, in designing and pulling together the events scheduled for this academic year. This could not have happened without each of these individuals' contributions and the coordination of departments and individuals from across the school. So in particular, I'd like to thank the Grand Rounds Committee which consists of faculty, staff, and students who developed the framing for today's session, as well as the Grand Round series for the year. I'd also like to thank the Office of Diversity, Culture, and Inclusion, the Office of Education for your great thought and joint thought leadership, and the many other partner offices of the school from communications to student affairs who have been involved in planning and launching these events. Most importantly, and lastly, don't run out when the discussion's over. Join us downstairs for a reception where we'll continue the conversation. And with that, I am thrilled to ask Dr. Fullalove to take it from here. So I've been asked to say something about the history of the events that we will be commemorating today and to talk a little bit about how it is that we got to this place at this point in the academic year for the Mailman School of Public Health. As many of you know, we are not alone here at Columbia to be thinking about the significance of 2019 and the 400 years that separate us from that fateful event that Dean Freed described 
as the arrival of 20 Africans, enslaved, showing up at the shores of Virginia, having been taken off a Portuguese man of war, to begin this nation's very sad, tragic history of slavery and, in, and the holding of human beings in bondage. The real beginning for me and for us at this institution is Mindy Fully Love, a 1978 graduate of the College of Physicians and Surgeons, a member of the faculty here from 1990 to 2016, who in starting to write her most recent book, Main Street, started to think about serial forced displacement and its impact on public health. She began with gentrification, the movement of populations replaced by other better off groups that take over the institutions and the culture of a neighborhood and result in the displacement of so many others. From there she goes to urban renewal. From 1949 to 1972, a significant portion of the formation of the urban environment in the United States was created by this federal law that displaced roughly one out of every six African American families. Thinking about African American history and the meaning of displacement, she then goes to forced migration and the history of the Great Migration at the beginning of the 19th century, when a substantial portion of the African American population moves from the south of the United States to the north. From there, she started to think about what we in the black community often refer to as being sold down the river. It turns out that roughly 30% of all African American families in the 19th century, during the period prior to the Civil War, were sold away from their families, leaving homes that they had on one plantation to join families in other plantations, often resulting in family members never seeing each other again. And then she got to the primary most important fact, the most important history of displacement element, the displacement of Africans from their homes in West Africa to places all over the New World. What is the meaning of this history? And why is it that so much of it has been forgotten? It became clear that as a psychiatrist, Mindy was very concerned about anniversaries. We have a funny thing in Western culture about anniversaries that end in zero. For example, next week, we will recall the events of 9-11. But who in this room doubts that in 2021, when 9-11 will celebrate its 20th anniversary, Folk from all over the world, the President of the United States will ultimately be here to recall this moment in American history. Minty's view as a psychiatrist is that anniversaries are events that we live. They aren't just remembered. They're part of our bodies, part of our souls. And the failure to recognize some anniversaries often results in us forgetting so many of the reasons why we are here, why it is we do what we do and why it is we are so often confronted by events that we don't completely understand, but obviously have their roots in history. It's clear from the discourse that has occurred since 2016 that Americans have forgotten so much of this history. I'm fond of recalling that the Center for Southern Poverty did a study in 2018 that indicated that only 8% of American high school seniors can cite slavery as the cause of the Civil War. I've repeated that statistic a number of times, and every time I say it, it amazes me. Because how much of American history is rooted in that particular history? And how much of the formation of this country, the writing of our Constitution, is also anchored in the logic of maintaining a slavery population in the midst of a democratic republic? It's not just African Americans that we're concerned with. The language of the Constitution, which made it possible for a democratic republic to hold folk in bondage, also accounts for our inability to understand the rights of immigrants, of Native American peoples, of other communities of color, of workers, and ultimately, as Dean Freed has mentioned, women. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which most Americans don't know anything about, the Asian Immigration Act of 1924, which shaped so much 
of immigration policy at the beginning of the 20th century has all but been forgotten as we struggle with issues of immigration right now, today, in the United States. Mindy has claimed that the thinking that made it possible for these two sets of events to occur side by side, the creation of a constitution that enshrined slavery and the oppression of people of color, immigrants and women, all represents a kind of a cognitive dissonance which has led to what she has described as the ecology of inequality. We live in the midst of that ecology. In a 2019 editorial written by Thomas Leviste, the current dean of the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine at Tulane, Mindy Fully Love and Me, we tried to say that this history has dramatic presence in the work that we do in public health to battle against health disparities, the struggle against inequality, the existence of schools of public health in an environment that is colored so dramatically by this logic of inequality means that all of us in public health should choose this year as the year where we start to really address in fundamental ways, not simply the history that led us to this point, but the ways in which that history is structured. So many of the health inequalities that we struggle to resolve and so much of the work that people here at Columbia are dedicated to do something about. We live in an, an ecology of inequality. We are clear we do not as an institution or as a nation want to live in the house of white supremacy. The 400 years of inequality movement is more than anything else a call for a radical reconnection to the principles of equality and the ways in which we in a community like this, in an institution like this, can join hands not just with professors, with students and members of the staff, but also can think about ways in which we are connected to the community outside these walls. When Mindy Fully Love and I got here in, 20, in 1990, 30 some years ago, the prevailing wisdom and orientation was always, whatever you do as a student, never cross Broadway. It was the most important case of institutional otherism I think I've ever experienced. Because our offices were on the other side of Broadway for many years, we remained something of a mystery to many of the students here. This was we, over on the other side of Broadway was them. Now that this community is being rapidly gentrified, we hope that this year will also be an occasion when the them become part of us. That what we do during this year won't just be a celebration of the science that battles against the forces of inequality, it will be an opportunity for us to get to know our neighbors, to feel, to feel part of a community named after one of the greatest slaveholders in our history, George Washington, but which at this point in the 21st century can be a statement that we all get to make about what we think the future will hold. This is about the future. Remembering history, understanding the dynamics of that history, understanding the ways in which it brought us to this moment, this is what I think makes institutions of higher learning such an important driving force in the battle for equality in a democracy like our own. We want to do something today to talk about the science that we're engaged in here. So my colleagues are going to engage in a conversation. We're trying not to do this as a lecture. We would like to have this as a, a kind of a dynamic interaction between us and you where we think about these issues the ways in which it's expressed in much of the science that many of us do here at Mailman, and think about ways in which it will impact the work that we'll do going forward. I don't need to tell you that in 2019, we're all anticipating 2020. Part of the reason for 400 years of inequality wasn't just to think about 2019, it's to think about what we will do with the next 400 years. How will what we talk about, think about, how will what we do in this very important year impact that future? How will we engage in the struggle to make sure that we do not, because of our inability to understand history, repeat its errors? That I think is the challenge that we have for this year and it's part of the challenge that we'll face today and the conversation we'll have with our panelists. So here's how it's gonna go. I'm gonna ask a question and ask each of my colleagues to respond 
in the order that you're currently <laughs> seated in. I think that's the easiest way to do it. So the following set of questions, let me begin with this one. In what way have you seen the negative impacts of racism from a public health perspective, thinking specifically about the work that you were doing here at this institution? David, may I ask you to begin? Sure. So um, I'm an associate professor in pediatrics and population family health. Um, I'm the medical director for the Young Men's Clinic at 21 Audubon. And for the last 20 years, I've lived and worked in the community as uh, working with young men. And so the impact, this, the age group that I work with is ages 14 to 35. Usually the guys that are left out of um, healthcare in one way, shape, or form, they definitely do not utilize primary care. Uh, as we know, they're also, also more likely to be incarcerated. Um, and when they come back and engage in healthcare, probably around the, by, by the research after the age of 40, they are already experiencing chronic illness, whether it's diabetes or uh, heart conditions, what have you. So the Young Men's Clinic is actually part of the process to sort of engage them, uh, create trust as much as we can over the years between 14 and 35 to keep them engaged in healthcare and hopefully do more preventive care through the relationship that we, that we work with. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add, uh, these were really moving remarks by uh, Dean Diaqua, Dean Fully Love, and Dean Freed, um, but I know uh, many of you have family and relatives in the Bahamas and Florida and the Carolinas, and uh, the footage that I saw this morning of the hurricane there was pretty harrowing, um, but on the theme of inequality, we know who gets impacted the most uh, from these events, so I just wanted to um, acknowledge that uh, if you're in this room and affected by, by the, this event. Um, in terms of racism and public health perspective and what I've uh, seen here, I mean, I want to start just kind of a little bit more broadly before the institution itself. Um, as a historian, and I appreciate very much the historical perspective you provided, Dr. Fullilove, and the whole framework of this year-long series of events, um, I'm fundamentally interested in um, something not unlike what you do in life course research, but instead of being focused on a particular uh, disease outcome or a particular uh, span of life, I'm really interested in the long-term origins of a lot of societal pathologies we all confront and study, whether it's residential segregation or um, sexism or ecological hazards uh, and so on. Um, I'm really glad that Dr. Freed mentioned Howard Zinn, um, because Howard Zinn was once asked, why do you study history? And he said, well, I have two options. I can either study history, or at least appreciate it, or I can take a Rip Van Winkle view of the world. Rip Van Winkle being the mythic character who woke up, did not remember anything, and had no idea why things were the way they were. Uh, I think the biggest thing um, that, that a historical long-term perspective provides is a sense that uh, things that we look at and kind of sometimes take for granted as things that just are uh, didn't always have to be that way and in fact weren't always that way. So it kind of it kind of takes away this inexorable uh, feeling that we often attach uh, to many of the challenges today. In terms of the institution itself, um, I'm. You know, I'm, uh, I'd actually really like to hear more from um, my colleagues here who do some work actively uh, with, with the surrounding community. One of my students uh, a couple years ago, Abby Sussel, who was a brilliant student uh, in SMS, wrote a thesis about the Washington Heights and Columbia University Medical Center. And she went through the archives of Columbia University uh, CUMC one of the great things about the fact that the archives are not a priority for CUMC is that they really didn't care what she looked at and they didn't do any screening. And she found some things that revealed a really, I think, tortured, tormented history. I'll give you one example. The Audubon Ballroom where Malcolm X was assassinated is not too far from where we are. And CUMC at one point decided to basically uh, move into it and reconvert it into a facility 
episodes like that that I think breed a, a lot of uh, distrust uh, among our neighbors, and I think it's something that I'm certainly very cognizant of, and I think all of us uh, uh, should be. I certainly don't think things are nearly as bad as that moment uh, that, that Abby wrote about, but it's still tense, and I feel a little, I've always kind of felt a little weird because I write about hardship, and I write about people who have experienced hardship, and you know, I've done decently for myself doing that, but the question is, do I enrich myself more, and does the institution that uh, that's, that subsidizes me uh, enrich itself more as a result. And so it's something I've, I've thought about a lot. It seems like your work is um, very much confronting that question by doing. Hello. So when I think about the um, negative health impacts of racism, um, I turn to the effects that we see in maternal health behaviors and maternal health outcomes. Um, especially among African American women. Um, it seems like um, not to be an epidemiologist, just the statistics, but the statistics kind of give you a sense of how um, morbid the statistics are and how grave the situation is. Um, I know everyone knows about Serena Williams and what occurred to her, but what occurred to her is not an abnormal situation. So if we think about um, the high income nations, um, there being 11, America leads in um, the highest rate for maternal death. So these are pregnancy complications that lead to the mother dying. and. Though it's highest, um, black women have a three to four times likelihood of dying from pregnancy complications. Um, they have a two times higher weight of having a low birth weight baby, which has massive implications for that child's life. Um, and we have the lowest rates of breastfeeding and the lowest duration of breastfeeding than any ethnic group. And all of these implications are not only affecting the woman, but it has long-term implications for our offspring. Um, so lately I've been doing some work looking at breastfeeding um, and doing a study where we're looking at the different biological changes that happen during the postpartum period and trying to understand postpartum associated breast cancer. And the reason this is important, as we know, breastfeeding reduces the risk of, of breast cancer. Um, however, African Americans that have the greatest mortality and morbidity of breast cancer don't breastfeed. <laughs> so trying to understand other um, barriers, uh, but not just understanding the barriers, but really involving them in the science of it all, like understanding, okay, um, the biology, like let's not just assume that um, I can look at every other population and everything would be the same. Let's actually include you in the discussion. Let's include you in the conversation. Um, so as a immunologist background, um, not only am I doing the biological exposures to really understand what's going on, I'm also asking them personal questions about our neighborhood, our catchment area. These are women from Washington Heights and Harlem. Um, why do you not breastfeed? What are your barriers? Um, to really get at what could we do as a community? What could our hospital do? What can I do to facilitate that more? Um, yeah, so I think that's one of the major negative health impacts when it relates to um, racism. Go, okay. Um, following right on what Jasmine said and adding to it, I'm going to focus on children's health outcomes because there is such great developmental susceptibility in utero and early childhood to the two major contributors that really come from racism and, uh, and discrimination, environmental exposures and stress. And these, uh, these two exposures, different kinds of stressors can interact to worsen the effects of each on children's health. And there are some very major, and I would point out there's growing evidence that not only do we know that the effects can be lifelong, but uh, there's evidence of transgenerational inheritance of these effects, and I'll hope to touch on that a bit later. But what are the current disparities in health outcomes in children? 
uh, preterm birth, low birth weight, infant mortality, twice the rate in African Americans compared to whites in, this, in the world's most affluent country. It's a shock. Childhood asthma, 60% higher rates in black children than white children. And obesity in childhood, 20% greater prevalence in black children. And there are also disparities in learning and uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. And these conditions can have an impact over the whole life course. So we know that preterm birth can uh, predict uh, cardio, uh, cardiovascular disease in adults, type 2 diabetes, psychiatric disorders. We know that childhood asthma can continue into adulthood but also lead to COPD in adults. Cognitive and behavioral disorders can affect, in childhood can affect learning and ultimately earning potential. And, uh, and an example of that is lead, uh, which uh, has been shown the, the cognitive behavioral problems associated with lead exposure, uh, we know now play out into a greater risk of antisocial and delinquent behavior. So long-term effects, and I, uh, uh, our work at the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health is focused on these two uh, environmental exposures and their interactions with stress due to racism and poverty. And, uh, and we see major disparities in environmental exposures. Shocking, uh, in 1979, Robert Bullard reported the disproportionate siting of hazardous landfills in predominantly black communities. That was a landmark study, and since then, the same patterns have been shown for air pollution. Most of the diesel bus depots and toxic uh, waste transfer stations are, are located in northern Manhattan, right? So we see that disproportionate uh, sighting right here. And uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals in fast food and personal care products, uh, the exposure is more common in, uh, in African American communities, communities of color. And there's greater exposure to pesticides because of under-maintained buildings where these pesticides are liberally sprayed to keep down roaches and so forth. And when we think of climate change, one of the number one challenges of our time due to fossil fuel burning are disproportionate impacts there, as we saw with Hurricane Katrina, for example. And then disproportionate exposure to stress, which has main effects and also can interact uh, uh, with the environmental contaminants. And just very quickly, there's evidence of transgenerational in uh, inheritance via epigenetic modifications, and that work is, has concerned air pollution, tobacco smoke, arsenic, and some other early life exposures. So we're learning much more about this and the lasting imprint of these, of these toxic exposures. And I would recommend that uh, wonderful work by uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, 1619, if you haven't read it, New York Times report on the legacy of slavery. Did, I think you probably already mentioned it, but. I think I sent a link to being free this morning. Good, it's really, really worth reading. We've argued that there's some value to studying history as a way of sort of understanding many of the dynamics of the health disparities that you've mentioned. One of the ways in which we think about slavery and its connection to modern medical and public health research has a great deal to do with the lack of trust that exists in many of our communities, especially at the point where we're trying to recruit participants in clinical trials, where a failure to believe that the science is going to benefit the communities where it's being conducted often leads folks to say, no thank you, when you're invited to attend. In your own work, are there instances in which you can sort of see this kind of direct link between the history of exclusion, exclusion and slavery as it's represented in the kinds of things that you're confronting today? Dr. Bell, you talked about that in your comments. I'm interested whether or not you're seeing that with the young men you interact with here. So we do have the legacy of Tuskegee uh, that uh, still pervades uh, the trust and mistrust of our medical institution even today. Uh, it's, it is talked about to some degree by our patients, but not necessarily as explicitly. Uh, but it is very much uh, 
voiced how much they distrust the system. Um, interesting enough, they, on another uh, sort of sideline to that, is they also think that we know more than we know. It's like they think that we have the cure for HIV but are hiding it from them. Uh, and sort of that aspect of what they perceive about what the institutions have and know and the, their exclusion from cures like Tuskegee, I think, is uh, an important sort of piece. Building that trust is really important, building that trust back to engage them in care and work with a lot of the misconceptions are really important. Check this one. As a historian. Okay. All right. I was gonna I was gonna pass the buck, but uh, <laughs> to people who work uh, more directly with patient populations and human subject research. But uh, you know, I'm, I, there's an interesting kind of quote uh, uh, from you know. I said that a lot of these medical centers, especially those in urban areas, uh, have very fraught relationships with those around them. Chicago and the South Side. Uh, Cle uh, the Cleveland Clinic and the and East Cleveland next to it, the Los Ange my hometown of Los Angeles uh, and the Watts neighborhood. Um, in, uh, 19, in the late 1960s after the Watts riot, uh, USC received a lot of money from the federal government to build a clinic in Watts. And this uh, community organizer that I studied went around asking the people of Watts what they wanted. And one of the first things he recorded is, I don't know, but I just don't want USC involved whatsoever. Again, though, I think we've actually improved on that. I think you know the first thing we think about uh, is is distrust and tension, but I think we're less focused on uh, some of the the improvements and ruptures from that legacy. Um, the two people at the far edges of the table seem to um, are really at the kind of forefront of community-based uh, research and, and providing of services. Um, these medical centers, I think, have done a much better job of not only providing actual jobs and employment, but also opportunities for people to ascend uh, on a career ladder. So while I think there's the tension is very much there and it's a shadow that we all work under, um, I don't think it's right to say that it's the same way it was uh, uh, 50 years ago. And I think um, it's our job to kind of figure out what we can, what we can take from what's been done uh, and how we can evolve it. I would say um, when I think about the study that I'm working on, um, I think a lot of the low rates that we're seeing in the study, but also just nationally when it comes to breastfeeding amongst blacks is that there's just this negative historical, historical reproductive experience. I mean, this is something that goes all the way back to slavery. Um, if we consider the notion of um, the myths about, which we talked about earlier, about black and white differences, one of the myths was that um, blacks have larger sexual organs, which resulted in uh, thinking that black women were more promiscuous. And if we think about today, the sexualization of women and um, especially black women. And then we also go back and black slaves, especially women, were often removed from their children to wet nurse for the slave master's children. So even if their child died, they were still placed in a situation where they had to wet nurse. Um, and just not having that choice. So I think um, if we're really talking about history and how history has lasting effects, whether it's established in our memory or if it's just kind of propagated through generations, um, I do think that it starts from there. And then um, I think as time grew and women could have a choice, African Americans especially, we were so disrupted in that naturalness of breastfeeding that when it came to the fact that we were making it ahead and we had met a benchmark and we were a little bit more affluent, to be seen breastfeeding looked less affluent than it would have. So then you have entire generations of black women who never breastfed. And then we come to today's time 
well, the, le the likelihood of you breastfeeding is dependent on your community, your squad. Did your mother, did your grandmother, did your aunt breastfeed? Because even though it's natural, it's not easy. And so we have the lowest duration of breastfeeding as well, because there are challenges that women face that's not just going back to work, but just challenges. And if you don't have your grandmother or your aunt or your sister or some of your ancestors behind you, then what is the impetus to continue? So I think that African American women as well as Native American women face this disrupted naturalness where it makes the choice very hard and even when the choice is made, to continue it is where's the information to continue it? Who am I supposed to talk to? Yes, well, there has been a pattern in research of sort of helicopter science where the researchers fly in, they ask their questions, they take the data, and they publish it in peer-reviewed journals, and that's about it. And the participants don't know what the findings are. They've not been translated any useful purpose for them. And we recognize that the need to do community-based research in, uh, in Harlem and Washington Heights and, North, and uh, the South Bronx, to do that in partnership with environmental justice groups and with a community leaders, community organizations. So in 1998, we began that partnership. Our lead partner is West Harlem Environmental Action, which many of you may know. And, um, and in the last 20 years, we've been conducting these studies um, of pregnant mothers and children, following them. Our oldest cohort is 20, the children are 21 years of age now, so we've been at it for a while. But this partnership allowed us to ask the right questions in the right way and get results that could be useful, accessible, and could be communicated well, effectively, to all the different stakeholders, to participants, physicians, to the community, and then on to policymakers who needed to make some real change. And I can tell about impacts if there's time, because there have been some real impacts of this partnership, which we never would have had without this close uh, bond. All right, how about I frame the next question as one that I'd like you to begin to answer, and then, once again, I'd like the members of our panel to think about this, too. We're going to have, throughout the course of this year, what I hope will be many more interactions with members of the Washington Heights and Harlem communities. It would be great if we can also include some of the other places where so many of our students and our faculty work. But one of the major issues will be, if we think about the nature of the communication, the interaction we'll have with these folks in settings like this, what are the questions that we should be asking? And what are the answers we should be seeking so that the work we do is that much more relevant for all the populations that we want to serve so that in being in these communities, we're actually seen as a force for good and not simply a problem that uh, everybody is trying their best to avoid. Since you've had the longest history with the Environmental Health Center, thinking about this, Dr. Pereira, can I ask you to sort of think about that as well, since you said if there's more time, you'd like to sort of get into that? What do the partnerships look like, and what are the questions that we should continue to ask about the work we do with the community? Well, I think the, the questions we need to ask are not only what are the impacts of toxic exposures, stress, other risk factors, but uh, to uh, ask ourselves, are we really being effective in making some change, either behavioral or policy change? And, um, and so we've been very careful to, to measure those impacts, and there have been some, there's been some good news. So on the side of air pollution, where we've shown that well, our research has shown links between air pollution, pesticides, and endocrine disrupting chemicals, flame retardants, and a number of adverse health impacts in children. And so it's been important to communicate the risks and the, and the, the harm to policymakers. And with WE Act and other community leaders, we've been able to put the data into the hands and minds of policymakers in New York City to improve uh, transportation, limit emissions from transportation sources, from oil burning and uh, heating, other combustion sources. And, um, and we act actually used our data to advocate for retrofitting of every single bus in the city, and that has happened. They also used our data to advocate for a tighter particulate matter standard, which 
the old EPA of 2012 uh, finalized a new tighter standard. With pesticides, we did show the benefits of reducing pesticides in decreased core blood levels of, of chlorpyrifos, the, the important one we were studying. And uh, we act used our data to argue for local or New York City ordinances, the first in the country, to protect um, communities against pesticides. And data on the effects on IQ were instrumental in a ban in New York State and other states. And uh, I could go on about flame retardants and our data being used to, to secure a, a class-wide uh, uh, regulation of flame retardants and, uh, and so forth. But it only worked because it's highly dis interdisciplinary research involving virtually all the faculties and <coughs> disciplines at the School of Public Health and, 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 and closely in working with the EJ and community groups. And in that way, we've achieved trust, and we have a very good retention of our subjects. It's 80% mm -hmm. in this oldest cohort, 21 years out. That's pretty good. It's exceptional. Yeah. 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 For everyone else, I'm thinking about, in my own remarks, I said that we're 14 months away from November 2020. Part of our not so hidden ulterior motives in thinking about 2019 to 2020 is really anticipate what will be a moment of rather important decision for the United States, if not for the rest of the world. Can I ask you to sort of think about 2020 and what we might accomplish this year with this reflection on 400 years of inequality that can prepare us for what I think many of us see as not just an uncertain future, but one that has all kinds of uh, terrors associated with it? David, can I ask you to think about that as well? Sure. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, my, I guess one of the things I was going to talk about that somewhat engages uh, that last question was this, the story of my research um, that was trying to engage young men in uh, sexual and reproductive health, basically supporting their partners on contraception use. It was the first time that the US government has ever had funding for uh, pregnancy prevention looking at young men as opposed to on women. And I'm sort of looking at November 2020, one of the things that happened was um, my, my research grant was, um, my funding was ended early, after they shortened is what the government <laughs> said uh, in a couple of years ago uh, as the new administration <laughs> took hold. And so I think that if we can figure out how to engage our young people in uh, civic engagement and understanding voting and the importance of that, I think it would be an, a really important part. I do find it's a, we have a complicated space. I was actually walking um, around this weekend in the neighborhood I live 10 blocks away, and there was an argument, or at least a discussion, going on outside of the uh, local barbershop. And one guy uh, was really talking about uh, supporting, um, or not supporting gun control because of the the mistrust of government and the, the need to have guns to have a, your own militia. And he's in New York City. <laughs> so it's a very interesting, and in our community. So it was a very interesting conversation to pass in Washington Heights. <laughs> to say the least. Can I ask the rest of you to sort of think about that? Hopes for 2020? always wanted to be a guest on Rachel Maddow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think one thing is just um, a shift in perspective. There was a sociologist, especially at this time, is you can open up a newspaper or you can watch Rachel Maddow or you can watch C-SPAN and it's really easy to just say, I want to go to bed and not wake up for a while. Um, and it can breed this sort of cynicism. And I think that's the wrong approach to take. And there's this, there's this line that stuck with me um, by a great uh, Columbia sociologist named Charles Tilley who died uh, maybe five years ago or so. 
Um, but he wrote this book called Durable Inequality, emphasis on the word durable. And he said inequality, once it happens, tends to get very entrenched and it's really hard to undo it. It's a really depressing book. It's not called kind of durable inequality or you know inequality that you can probably reverse. It's called durable inequality. So it's kind of a depressing book to read. And a couple of years before he passed away, the Guardian newspaper interviewed him about, um, about his work. And all of his books are kind of like this. He's got a book saying that the basis of the modern state, like the United States, is war and militarism, et cetera. So he was asked about, about the, the nature of his work. And he said, no, I actually don't think my work is fundamentally pessimistic. It's fundamentally, in some ways, hopeful because everything that I write about was made by humans, and if it was made by humans, it can be undone by humans. So I think that's the first thing uh, to remember about uh, 2020. Second thing is that we're kind of in a vibrant social movement uh, moment that I think is kind of surprising. Um, the labor movement is showing huge signs of life. There have been teacher strikes all across the country that have been successful. The flight attendants union was partially responsible for stopping the government uh, shutdown. We have four high profile movements that are putting things on the public agenda in a way that's shocking to me. Uh, Black Lives Matter, Occupy Wall Street, Me Too slash Time's Up, and uh, the March for, for Our Lives uh, about gun control. So I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot to kind of build on, uh, and that's really kind of popped up uh, since, since in, the pa in the past five years or so. Dr. Bell mentioned youth, too. I mean, this isn't a cheap pander to the audience, but the youth, when you look at public opinion polls, like actual science, not just impressions, but actual kind of scientific, so youth care about climate change the most, they think uh, it is an impending, important problem the most, and they're very concerned about uh, economic inequality and a lot of the things that we care about. So I have hope for the youth. I just want them to register and make sure to wake up. <laughs> I think that's something that was like implemented in me early since my father's from Tuskegee, Alabama. It was like, I don't care what you do, but you must vote. It doesn't matter if you have a candidate, you, you, both, you don't like either one just go with the less of the two evils, like that. but you vote. So I definitely think that's one of the um, messages is just to talk to our young people, talk to our older people, talk to our elderly people that can't make it out to the polls, like, you know, just engage them and also be an agent for that engagement. So um, one thing, and with this panel is I end up talking to a variety of different people just about the 400 years of inequality. I talked to um, a Vietnam veteran who experienced greater equality when he was in Vietnam than when he came back. Um, I spoke to my father who remembers taking road trips and not being able to get into um, hotels and camping out in the car. Um, I talked to my uncle who is a PhD in education and was the first superintendent after a 300 year history in um, PG County. Um, so just talking to them, I just realized like change is possible. It, it seems <laughs> very impossible, um, but when I actually hear people's stories, individual stories and engage with them, I learn something and I'm more encouraged. But I also kind of take a tool away from that that I can utilize in other conversations. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I think we have to do is have conversations, not attacks, not um, I can't speak with you because I know who you voted for. Like, let's just engage in these conversations. And I think if in the 2020, what I want to see is actually being to being able to civilly engage with someone who's thinking about voting for Trump and have a conversation and actually keep having that conversation and be that agent. I mean, I know it's stressful. Um, <laughs> and as public health practitioners, we often just talk to the choir, right? I'm, I'm sure we're all speaking, speaking to the choir when we think about what we want to happen in 2020. But it's really talking about people outside of our sphere um, that is really going to make that change. So that's what I'd like to see in 2020 for myself and for all the students in the audience. Like, engage in conversations outside your comfort zone. Just don't talk to the image 
of yourself, which are your classmates. Like really go out and like have those challenging conversations. If you happen to hear someone <laughs> wanting to have a militia um, and you're not scared, I would say, you know, <laughs> well, did you, I mean, I'm really interested in where, what's your point of view? Um, that's, and that's one thing I think when we um, talk about community, we often go into the community with preconceived notions of what we want. And so sometimes we go into conversations with preconceived notions of how we want that conversation to go. And I think we have to stop that. Um, I think the only way to overcome what we're experiencing right now is to really come together amidst our differences. All of the above. Um, <laughs> but I would add, you know, we haven't been so good at presenting a vision of a future that is different, that is sustainable, equitable, you know, and healthy. And, uh, and yet it's happening, it's happening in different mostly at the local levels, the state level, the federal government's dead in the water right now. But we have examples to show people that things can change, their actions, their votes can matter, and that there can be great improvement in health. We need to communicate that better, not always the bad news, but some of the good news to incentivize people to act. I think part of the problem has been a paralysis, a sort of hopelessness, and that's true for climate change, you know, stare at the ceiling. But there's much we can do and that is being done. And I think youth are definitely the answer, but I won't throw away grandparents because they care deeply about their grandchildren and their future. And we can you, you know, use that concern, heart, gut, love of children, care for them. It's a universal value in every culture. We can use that, it's important. So I'm not, I'm not, totally optimistic about the next election, but I, I have some optimism there. And has anyone seen Greta Thunberg on the subject of climate change? Yep. Pretty powerful voice of a 14-year-old child uh, on the need to act. So get out there, young people. <laughs> we began this session with a land acknowledgement. Dr. Diaquan, thank you for that. But it's also kind of a nod in the direction of institutional racism. This is the problem of having this mic here. We acknowledge that we are in an institution that was partially created by the capitalism that grew around the sale of human bodies and the use of those bodies to generate one of the most powerful economies in the world. What are your hopes for Columbia University? We're thinking about 400 years of inequality and its impact on public health. But what about institutions like this that have now recognized we have a kind of a scary past? What does that say about our present and about our future? What are your hopes for, for example, this coming year and, and what we might do to think through issues of institutional racism and what we do to change the direction that has been so much a part of this institution's history? And once again, let me ask each of you to take a turn at that. I th where my thoughts go are, um, I'm on the, now on the admissions committee, or I potentially will be approved to be on the admissions committee in the next couple of months for the medical school. Uh, and in that context, um, I hope, and we are doing a relatively good job, but there are also some influences such as the Harvard lawsuits and other lawsuits that have changed how admissions can be um, administer how we make our decisions and how we sort of how transparent we need to be so it's uh, I'm just learning some of these new sort of ways but my hope is that as an institution we train more and more individuals that look and look like the communities that we want them to serve in uh, so that they can connect that does not mean that everyone has to look the same way as their community it, that lives in the community But it does mean that uh, it would be great if the community sees Individuals like them I, from a youth perspective I would say it also is a role model for our young people to know that they can uh, Succeed in many ways more than they usually see in our community 
Um, I was wondering, uh, Dr. Filov, if I could maybe riff on the term institutional racism, but I promise to answer the question at the end. Well, um, you know, I like riffs. Yeah, so, you know, I don't know, know. riffs are cool, <laughs> riffs are cool. Um, and I've, been, I've been thinking recently about um, the term institutional racism and um, kind of the notion of structure and how we use it uh, in public health. Um, so if you're a first year student, and uh, you know you haven't taken any classes yet, you've only taken one class, by the end of the semester, if we are successful, you will have been brainwashed into the importance of structure over individual. That is, things outside an individual are a lot more important fundamentally than anything um, that one individual does or, or eats or, or, or whatever. And you know, I'm a structural thinker, uh, and partially why I was attracted to public health, but I think we tend to define structure in kind of these SES measurements or measurements of racism or measurements of sexism with uh, that are very precise but are missing one thing and that's humans and actual policies that made those metrics uh, those structural metrics what they are and so recently you know the the typical somewhat cliche way of, of describing the analysis is you either have structure or you have agency and people tend to focus on one or the other. And I've been focusing a little bit more on agency recently, um, but it's agents who have done things that have created the sort of structures that we're uh, trying to dismantle or, or repair. Um, and so to the question specifically, I think one thing Columbia can do is look to its past, and I think this is one thing the 1619 project that Professor uh, Pereira has mentioned is trying to do for the nation as a whole, but I think Columbia, whether it's the medical center or the university writ large, um, can really look to its past and look at the very specific agents that are uh, responsible um, for, for the university's role in exacerbating uh, inequality at previous moments in its time in contributing um, to, to racist types of thinking, uh, et cetera. And I know there is an ongoing effort to do um, this uh, at the downtown campus. There is a course that has been taught for a number of years and that the university has profiled in its, its periodicals um, called Columbia and Slavery. And what, what this course is, I believe all of you can actually take this course too, um, um, but it's mostly undergrads who go through the records of Columbia and they try to see how much of Columbia's early wealth uh, was directly or indirectly uh, a result of, 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 of the slave trade or financing that, was, um, that came from slave sales. And I think that kind of reckoning um, uh, not just around slavery, but environmental justice or uh, any number of issues um, is something we can do as an institution. Again, not to point fingers and say you're guilty, and, um, but to, to have an honest record of, 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 of the agents that are responsible for the kind of structures we're trying to repair. So um, when I think about institutional racism, I really think about the institution of the academy. So, and I start, because of my research and um, the background of the research is that I was really interested mainly in the biological processes that occur um, in the postpartum breast and the inflammation and the molecules and et cetera. And I then started just listening to the women who I was um, recruiting into my study and um, some of them are low SES and some of them are not. And then, but listening to like, yes, I'm going to school and I'm, a, and I'm a single mom, or yes, I'm doing this and this, and the bars that they're climbing academically to do better for their children. And I reflected on that and I was like, wow, you know, why is it then that at the end of the day, my social status, um, a black woman's social status by education or income does not protect her from some of these maternal outcomes that we're talking about. So I'm talking to these participants who are climbing, 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 and they're gonna get so far, but their health is going to be compromised as well because the farther the bar you climb, the idea is that you're weathered. So you're going through constant assaults of micro and macro aggressions because you're in environments where you typically are not. And um, I have three friends, all with equivalent social status, um, 
who almost died in pregnancy. So they almost died in labor. And they should have been completely protected in my mind. Um, but the only thing I could think about was that, you know, climbing and climbing and climbing as a minority could actually be, while it's beneficial, wear on you. And I know this sounds um, slightly controversial, but I think institutions, especially Columbia's and the Harvard's and the Yale's and those institutions that are really pushing that diversity initiative also have to invest in that knowledge that climbing to these levels is not without its own biological, physiological strains. And when I think about our students, you guys are getting your master's in public health. I was in school for a very long time. <laughs> and depending on what you want to ascend to, you are going to accumulate these stressors, whether they be micro, macro, overt, they're going to happen. And one thing I would say that I'm very impressed with Columbia is the creation of Odyssey, which was not just for students, but also faculty. And also being able to report these things happening. So I think the implementation of the recognition that this journey for minorities and people of color are not without physiological strains that can actually lead to generational issues, not just for my health, but for our children's health. Um, and so reflecting on that as now and the future and what, how we want that to look for um, other minorities that are coming up in this and trying to get ahead. I can't add very much. I think this is all really critical. Diversification of the student body, of the faculty, acknowledgement of the past and the, uh, the, the roots in slavery and racism, uh, promoting research and writing on, on equity and how to achieve an equitable society. Um, I think sometimes that kind of work is slighted. And if there could be an initiative to actually support and promote, especially young people starting to engage in that line of research. And then, as Jasmine said, I mean, support for, for students and others experiencing the stresses that she mentions. I think that's very important. So I, I can't add too much, but to say I agree. <laughs> We've got uh, 15 minutes before the end of the session. This is when we turn it over to the audience. And a PhD student here once told me that um, historically dying in this area, if you have no money, no family, is kind of just terrible. And so I just wanted to know if you had any, or, and Dr. Bell also talked about um, chronic illnesses and how men are, or in this area, are diagnosed with chronic illnesses earlier and earlier in life. So I was wondering if there were any barriers to that as well, being diagnosed early or like, yeah. Thank you. Do you want to take this first no. one? <laughs> so I'm not, I can't speak to the first question. Okay. I can sp speak to the one that you're, you've asked directly. <laughs> so um, I, so the context is young men in general across the United States actually drop off from seeing primary care uh, after the age of 15, uh, whereas females actually increase their use of uh, health care after the age of 15, primarily for sexual and reproductive health issues for women. And men, young men use the emergency room if they're going anywhere, but their u overall utilization goes down. Um, and so it's that period of time that I, I, my point was that we lose them until probably around the age of 40 where they re-engage, but that's in many cases too late or with uh, sort of significant chronic illnesses that are being diagnosed at that time. Unfortunately, I would say even in my uh, experience, I have had a handful of 30-somethings, 33-year-olds that have had triple bypasses. And it's partly because of the social determinants of being in a low-income community. Hi, thank you so much. Um, 
I had a question. Um, so I am a physician and I'm going back to uh, public health school because I think it's really important. But some of the things that I've seen is it's wonderful that Columbia is talking about this, that Harvard, you know, all the great institutions of the country. But what about the middle of the country where this is really affecting, you know, in Texas, in Iowa, in Wisconsin? Um, those are the places where structural racism really still exist a lot more. Um, and I see it in the patients that come to me that they hold these biases, whether they're, you know, against or for racism, essentially. So um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how do we get this to spread throughout the country as a United States rather than just in these institutions that we are at? Let me say a partial answer to that. that you're invited to visit the 400 Years of Inequality webpage, which is maintained by the New School here in New York City. You'll discover that there are dozens and dozens of institutions and cities, communities in the Midwest, which are actually choosing this moment as an opportunity to reflect on their local histories. We're not just talking about what happens nationally, but we're saying wherever you are, there's something about the structure and the history of the places that you occupy that have had a dramatic impact on your health, and they do tell us something about the importance of understanding our history, the development of racist expressions of the conditions that create the health that we worry about. So what are your thoughts about that? How do we get into that? And you'll discover that more and more institutions as well as more and more communities are finding these conversations to be a very useful way to think not just about the present, but what they want to do in the future. 400 Years of Inequality is the name of the website. I'd, I'd be really interested if you got a chance to look at it, to see what you think about some of the commentaries that have been posted by other cities, other communities, other neighborhoods, where their issues are pretty much the same that you just cited. Others? Well, I have a challenge for Dean Freed. She has developed, uh, with colleagues, a, a major initiative, a curriculum on climate change, right? Health impacts to share among all the schools of public health. How about another curriculum to share across schools of public health on this issue of the, uh, the, the legacy of slavery and racism? Because I, I understand what you're saying, Bob, but I'm not sure it's, a, it, it's, it's universally, this information is universally shared among public health and other educational bodies. Do you think I'm right? Yeah, <coughs> no question about it. Yeah. Uh, but, for example, Dean Freed introduced the notion that we would be doing this in the Dean's meeting in July of 2019. And I know that when 2020 comes around, do you have a lot to say? Please? Yeah. We need the, yeah, I think the only mic is over there. Come here. So um, thank, thank you all in general for really a fabulous discussion and for the profound work you're each doing. Um, I'm just standing up here to respond to um, Dr. Pereira's point. And, you know, one of our hopes is that the journey we're on as a school, which does not start today, it's been going on a long time. The journey we're on as a school, as a place of learning, as a place of innovation, as a place that's deeply committed at its roots to equity. Uh, is that we learn together how to build communities of equity, that we figure out what the ingredients are, that we then can do perhaps what Ricky was saying and contribute that knowledge um, to the pool of other places that are trying to figure out a recipe that nobody's figured out yet. That's our commitment in terms of, one of many commitments in terms of leadership is that we use these conversations and everything else we're doing, not just to improve as, hum, as individual human beings, but to create knowledge of how organizations create the change towards the vision that we think is one that will elevate both the floor and the ceiling of health and opportunity for everybody. That's our mission. Uh, 
Uh, so, uh, I mean, this obviously has been a very moving hour, hour and a half. What was, I was surprised that was missing was an explicit recognition that the forms of inequality in America are not simply linked to race and ethnicity or gender, but that America is the most unequal country in the advanced capitalist world, that amazingly, we have become more unequal over the last 40 years, that we have gone from the 1970s to now, so that it's not simply captured by the notion of 1%, but the level of inequality in America, which affects every dimension of our lives, is so severe. And I think people are more or less aware that there's something called race. I don't think Americans really understand how unequal this country is. And that goes to the issue of social class. Uh, it goes to the issue of whether people are poor and white. And I think until we begin to confront the question of why it is that we have become more unequal in the recent history, we're not going to get beyond it. Part of it is obviously the destruction of American trade unions. Part of it has been the transformation of the American tax structure. But one of the most amazing things about being in the School of Public Health is that in a, in a nation that has in practice embraced inequality, schools of public health talk about health as a human right. They talk about the importance of equality. And that, I think, we can learn something from the dialogue about how race and history and slavery shaped America. But we have to understand the other side of this, too and that we're not going to resolve the question of racism while we maintain a country of classism. Thank you. We have time for one final question. Um, in these discussions of social injustice, I can't help but think about one of the greatest uh, forms of social injustice on my radar currently, which is the detention centers. And I just want to think about what can we as public health professionals do? Because we've seen examples of trauma, we've seen examples of children being separated from their parents or them being held together, not incarcerated per se, but still to some extent. And so what can we do to circumvent, circumvent the kind of health issues that we can predict are going to occur as a result of these, um, these camps? In the remarks I gave in orientation, what I tried to point out was that you can look at mass incarceration in the United States in 2020 and draw a direct line to 1619. Three articles in the Constitution explicitly make slavery possible. It took an amendment to the Constitution in 1865 to end slavery, but the interesting exception to the rule was if you are guilty of a crime, then, for all intents and purposes, your rights as a citizen are basically abridged. Look at the 13th Amendment and the impact it has had on mass incarceration in the United States. You can see a direct line that takes us from the displacement of Africans in 1619 to a penal system that is roughly 64% non-white. And having a number of our students here at Mailman who've been through prisons and who are now studying public health with a commitment to go back to their communities, at least as one of the ways in which with that small piece of American history and its current manifestation, we here at Mailman are really trying to do something important to say enough. It's 5.30. This is the moment when we end this session. Thank you so much for participating. This is where I get to say we hope that you'll join us for Grand Rounds October 14th when we'll have one of the more important kickoff sessions for this academic year. And maybe let me invite all of you to join us, please, for a reception that we'll have downstairs beginning now. Thank you.